we're going to carry on with our third talk before afternoon tea. Um, Kesky is going to talk to us about using Go for DevOps. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for letting me come and speak here. Um, this is my first time at Linux Conf AU, and I'm super excited. Uh, first time in Tasmania. Uh, and so uh, uh, let's dive right into it. Um, uh, this talk, if I can get my slides to advance. Come on. Click. Why aren't you? All right. This talk is about Golang, um, and specifically how it's really, really useful for DevOps. Um, who here is hurt? to build reliable, efficient, multi-threaded, scalable architectures that solve a lot of problems. But the great thing is, even though it was originally designed as a language for writing you know, public-facing customer services, it also has a lot of features that make it super duper for DevOps, okay? Now, um, I'm a big fan, obviously, of Go. Um, but ironically, in the five and a half years I worked at the company that invented it, I wrote no production Go. It was only after I left that company and went to work for Microsoft that I'm now using Go all the time. Um, so uh, I got two secret topics that I hide inside this talk. And one is that um, as someone who's been using Linux since pre 1.0, um, there's been a huge change in the community and culture around Linux and in cross platforms and the platform wars. I mean, anyone who was using Linux in the 90s and in the early 2000s remembers this time of vitriol where, where the, the conversation went, I love my platform, I hate your platform, therefore I hate you, okay? And that's been the narrative for a very, very long time. Now what I hear almost ubiquitously is, I love my platform, okay, I see why you like your platform, it's kind of cool, you're kind of cool, maybe there's a way that my platform can talk to your, work, your platform and we can work together to get something, uh, something done. And I think this is an evolution of, of, of the whole microservices movement, but before that, RESTful services and whatnot. All we really care about are APIs and outcomes. It doesn't really matter what is behind the HTTP request you're making or this uh, 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 HTTP2 or whatever your, your transport is. As long as you're getting the results back, I can deal with interoperability as long as I have a meaningful interface. So success no longer matter. It no longer matters that you're running the same platform I am. As long as you have an API I can call, uh, we're all good. And I think that's a really great thing. And I think we're in an amazing renaissance in our industry for the past couple of years. And it's going to get things are just going to get better and better. So, uh, rant over. Um, what about Go? So here is the ubiquitous example that shows uh, how you write, what a Go program looks like. This is Hello World in Go. Um, it's Simple, straightforward. There are tons of resources that'll help you learn Go and practice Go. You can even in a browser just go to, uh, there's a website where you go and you literally type in the Go right there and it compiles and runs it and shows you what comes out. So this is what Hello World looks like. Um, it's simply you have a function that, that you, a library that provides string formatting that also provides the print line function and you simply say, well, here's a string, print it out for me and you're good to go. Um, when it comes to building this program, um, you simply say go build and main.go, and what you get is a, program, a file called main, and as this file output shows, I've got an ELF 64-bit executable. Um, it's statically linked and not stripped, okay? And that's the really important thing when it comes to, to DevOps is it's statically linked. This binary, if I put it on any system that's capable of executing an ELF 64-bit program that has the uh, 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 version one sysv ABI on it, this program will run. Okay? I don't need any external runtime environment. I don't need the right .so's. I don't need uh, anything to be there other than maybe ld.so um, to gain the linking to uh, glibc um, to run this program. And that's a beautiful thing. And this is what makes Golang perfect for DevOps. Very few people have the luxury of having a, a purely homogenous environment, whether it's even just different versions and releases of Linux, if you're a Linux shop, there's always going to be a blend of things. Even most people I know who manage majority of Linux environments, they prefer Mac OS on their, on their uh, laptop, right? But while they're mostly similar systems, they are different. Um, when you write a Go program and deploy it, you don't need to get any dependencies when you go and put it onto the target system. There's no comp CGAN, comprehensive Go archive network, which has its own package manager that's orthogonal to the operating system's package manager because making that consistent from operating system to operating system to operating system is such a difficult problem. You basically just get one file, it's an EXE or uh, an ELF uh, program or uh, whatnot, and you just put it on the system and you can run it. You just, if you can get the binary to the machine, you can run the, the binary. So um, we live in an explosion of platforms. Now, while it is true that with Bash, 
uh, and with Python. You can kind of get some cross-platform stuff, but I've worked in environments where they try and make portable Python programs, where there's one program that does some really useful administrative task, and they try and keep the same kind of runtime in all different environments, but then you end up with Python 2.x or, or 2.x plus 1 on some of the systems, and 2.x minus 1, or even you know, Python 3 on some of them, and now you've got to deal with all these cross-platform compatibility issues, as well as it's just simply deploying the program requires you to deploy all the right packages that depend on it. And you basically end up with a separate management function just to manage the tool that if you're, if, if you're a sysop, that tool is trying to manage something which is the actual job. Yet you're now having to manage your tool like your actual job. And all of this is extra effort. So I love the fact that with uh, Golang, you don't have any of those externalities. So thinking back to our Hello World example, let's say that a coworker comes along and says, oh, wow, you know, they see me running my Hello World program, and like, wow, that's an awesome Hello World program. Except my system, uh, it runs on Windows. I'd really like a Windows version of that Hello World utility, because you know, it's the best Hello World that, uh, uh, they could imagine. Well, if I want to take that exact same program and build it for Windows, I only have to set one environment variable. Now, this is on my Linux build environment. I set the Go OS environment variable, or Goo's environment variable, to simply say Windows, go build main.go. Exact same build command. All I've done is change an environment variable. And I now get, instead of a main, I get a main.exe. And sure enough, it's a PE32 uh, console executable for MS Windows. And I say, here's your exe. And they say, oh, what, what DLLs do I need to run this? None. You don't have a runtime, you don't need .NET this, you don't need whatever, you don't need Mono's runtime. You just say, here's your exe, go run it, and you're going to be hello worlding like a boss. Okay? Um, now, that's great and all, and we're all high-fiving. Hey, yeah, hello world everywhere, we're doing great. The Windows guys are in, the Linux guys are in, and then some Mac OS guy comes along and says, wait, I want hello world too. Well, guess what? It's, it's quite easy. Goose equals Darwin. Now, file main. Now, this will overwrite your, your Linux one, but hopefully you've got your build environment figured out. You know, it's delivering your Darwin binaries to your, your Linux boxes. But, um, and now you get a mock executable, again, 64-bit, ready to run and now you're deploying onto Mac OS. So literally just by changing an environment variable, the exact same program is now running on Linux 64-bit, Windows uh, and uh, Mac OS. And all I had to do was set an environment variable. Now the beauty of this, I didn't have to go and install cross-platform compatibility runtimes or anything. Just simply installing the Go compiler, you get out of the box all of these platforms, okay? Now, the great thing is, it's not just those, you also get NetBSD. Look at that, NetBSD. All we do is say NetBSD, and now we're running on NetBSD. The exact same awesome Hello World program, NetBSD, OS 10, and so on. And this goes on and on. OpenBSD, again, for free, out of the box, you're ready to create OpenBSD executables. Same source code, same everything. All you're doing is building it, and one file, you copy it onto the target system, and you're ready to go. Um, FreeBSD, of course, you've got to have FreeBSD if you have NetBSD. Um, Solaris, you know, Solaris, right there. Easy. Um, now, all this stuff's great, but someone will notice a bit of a theme with all these different versions of operating systems. These are all current, more or less current operating system. Now, let's say Alice comes to you, all right? Now, we already have a Windows 64-bit executable, and Alice comes to you, and, and she's the person that everybody feels really bad for in, in sysops, because she's the one stuck dealing with that third-party app that somebody in marketing bought that they deployed onto a, a desktop workstation, but it somehow became mission critical as part of their workflow. Um, they bypassed procurement, and they now built an irreplaceable process around it, and it was done back in 2010, and it's running on Windows 7. And they can't get the app to virtualize successfully for some reason because it's Windows 7, and it's a weird app. And the vendor who sold them that product went bankrupt in 2014. So there's no support, no nothing, but you can't get rid of this app. Now this happens all the time in business where you've got an, essentially an impossibly to support system and you're trying to keep it al alive with, with, with chewing gum and whatnot. But you know what? Look at that. Take Go, Go OS Windows and add Go Arch 386 and you'll get a 32-bit 386 compatible executable. And all of a sudden you're now running Hello World on Windows 7. Exact same code, right? This makes life so much easier if you're trying to bring these archaic legacy systems into a common set of management tools. So, I'm about to say something really controversial. Goes better than either Bash or Python, all right? Now, the reason why I say this is, every, who here identifies as a system administrator? Most of us. Who here writes Bash? I write a lot of Bash. Who here writes Python? A lot of Python, right? Python and Bash are the go-to languages, pun intended, 
un unintended, I don't know, uh, of system administrators. But the fact is, we are no longer just sysadmins. We are dealing with services. Our management tools are now becoming part of workflows, part of critical workflows, business processes that need to be supported and maintained on a going forward basis. That means we need to begin in our day-to-day -day work applying rigorous software engineering discipline to how we manage our stuff. I mean, 15 years ago, it was kind of a novel idea. Wait, you mean I should check my bash scripts into revision control? Nowadays, if you find someone who isn't checking into to Git or to uh, uh, some other version control system, their management tools, you're like, why aren't you doing that? Why is everything on your laptop? And if you're not here, we can't run the tools that we do to manage our business, right? We are becoming, whether we like it or not, software engineers who happen to run systems. That's just part of what we're dealing. So we want to use languages and tools that support that paradigm. Bash and Python were not designed as software engineering languages. They were designed as scripting languages. But our scripts are no longer this long. They're no longer even this long. They're now thousands and thousands of lines long with multiple modules and multiple uh, contingencies. So you need release management, you need all those other things. Now, I'm a big believer there's no such thing as a, just a shell script in systems. Ops tools are not this second class citizen when it comes to how our software and our systems are managed. They need to be treated as first order citizens and we need to use languages that have things like type safety classes, uh, packages, and a sane release management model so that we can apply the correct rigor to how we're doing our work, okay? Now, so congratulations, you all know, go and say, oh yeah, I'm a software engineer and a sysop. So that's what DevOps kind of comes down to, is applying software engineering discipline uh, to the sysop uh, business, pro business function. Um, if you're still the sort of sysop who believes your job is to push buttons and run scripts, you're in a dying career. No longer is that enough to run the systems at scale that we need, because if you have a button to push for a business process and now there's a thousand buttons, you have a thousand times more work. If you automate the pushing of that button, you now have the same amount of work whether you have a thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 systems. And I think this is a good thing because humans are really valuable resources. You are all smart, intelligent, capable, lateral thinking things. And when you have a, 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 a ticket whose workflow is, oh, go look up this procedure, run these 15 different commands, copy and paste this here and here, and then hit enter, you're being treated like a machine. And that shouldn't be our default state. Humans should not be treated like machines. Machines should do the machine stuff. Humans should do the stuff that requires the intelligence and the creativity of a human being. Um, so let's get back into the uh, um, uh, Golang stuff because Hello World's a very simple program and it actually doesn't do anything useful for, uh, for um, uh, coding. Most of what our scripts do is run other tools, right? And so uh, Golang has an ability to run subprograms, right? And it's a little bit more, uh, it's syntactically different than Python, but it's really not much different than using the Python subprocess module or any of the other wrappers around it that try and solve all the other problems around it. And so here I've got something that just runs the date command. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Captures the output uh, and then prints it out. Right? But that basic pattern of I want to run a program, capture the output, and maybe do something to see what the output was is endemic in many, many management scripts and utilities. And it's no harder to do in Go than it is to do in Python. The difference is, remember, across Darwin, OS 10, uh, I'm sorry, OS 10 and Darwin, uh, uh, Windows, uh, Linux, BSD, Solaris, you can write one script and it runs on all those platforms without you having to maintain compatible runtime environments on all those platforms. So when it comes to running a subprocess, we very, end up, we very often end up dealing with platform-specific code. In this case, I'm just trying to get you know, the, the dump of the status of all the network adapters. Now, this is obviously a, a Linux solution. Um, and if I was trying to write a tool that captured this and then maybe uploaded it to a config database or something, I would need to do something different for different operating systems. So what we'll do is we'll refactor this a tiny bit, and instead of just directly executing the command, we're gonna use a little bit of syntactic sugar and say, I wanna call a function that says, give me the appropriate command to run for the environment I'm in. Because even though it is cross-platform and all that, there is still operating, specific, operating system specific code that you have to work with. But the good news is the language itself has built in support of how to interface and deal with, this is the code path for operating system A, this is the code path for operating system B. So we take the actual uh, finding of that command and we turn it into a, a function that gets us the command. And then that syntactic sugar exec command cmd zero and basically says, call the exec thing with the first thing in the array followed by everything else in the array. Basically a variadic function expansion. So if you've got three elements in the array, it'll call exec appropriately. If you've got 50 elements in the array, it'll call it with a 50 element call. All right? So 
our get command function simply returns an array um, which contains ifconfig and hyphen a. And this is how we have extracted out the operating, spe operating system specific elements of that command line. So we then take that function though and we take it out of that main.go file and we put it in a file called main underscore linux.go. Now the, the Go compiler is smart enough that if it sees underscore and something that could be a Go OS environment variable, it will only include that code if you're compiling for that target. So this here is the exact same uh, bit of code as the very first example, and all it does is gather the uh, ifconfig output. But we can now add main underscore windows.go, and look at that. We have ipconfig slash all instead of ifconfig dash a. We now have the exact same functionality for gathering uh, uh, IP configuration information, and we only have to maintain one tiny slice of code that's different per platform. All right? Ah, but what about these BSD guys? Uh, are we going to leave them out of the fold? No, we're not, because Golang actually has even more capability to define platform-specific code. So you could obviously do this. Now, given, the example, given what I've described, this will be a valid solution, right? We now have main underscore FreeBSD, we have main underscore Linux, we have main underscore Windows, and we then have our actual program, and that's where all the logic of you know, the database connection to the, the configuration management system and whatever you're gonna do with that data to upload it to your auditing environment or, or so on, all that's hidden in main, and it's the exact same code on every single platform. Because, of course, the, the net HTTP and all those libraries are provided identical cross-platform. It's only the actual command line to get that dump of bytes that tell us all about it that, that varies. And of course, you could also have a function that parses it and returns you know, IP addresses and interface names if you wanted that's platform specific, but that's all exercise for you guys to go do. But of course, from a software engineering perspective, this is not a good solution. This is where you would end up if you were using Python or even a bash script that was trying to, you know, if uh, uh, you name dash whatever uh, was this, then I'd have this. And you end up with this duplication of code. One of the important principles of software engineering is the don't repeat yourself principle. And here we have the exact same ifconfig dash a in two different platforms. That's not a good thing. So instead, you just say, I want main underscore Unix like. Now, Unix like doesn't mean anything. It's not magic to the Go compiler. But instead, I've added a magic comment to the top of the file where I say plus build Linux, Darwin, NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD. That means if I'm compiling for any of those targets, use main underscore Unix like. If I'm compiling for main underscore Windows, use the other file. So now, simply by eliminating the other file, I now am targeting one, two, three, four, five, six platforms with the exact same tool that will gather data. And that could extend to any other of the supported platforms, right? So there are two mechanisms, as I said, that allow Go to make it very easy to write code for different platforms. The first is you create a file named after the Go OS variable that is for the target that you're trying to compile for. The second is you use a build directive at the top of the file. These are completely interchangeable. They do the same thing. The only reason there's two is for software engineering. So you don't have ifconfig a repeated in nine different files for nine different platforms. All right. Now, in the case of that plus build, I have Linux, 386, and Darwin. Things separated by a comma mean and. This file should be included if you're targeting Linux with a 386 uh, architecture or if it's Darwin. And you can mix and match these things to create custom combinations. Um, so you specify your target operating system with a Go, Go, uh, Go OS variable, and you specify your target architecture with Go Arch, or you specify both. Now, this is the current set as of uh, the end of last year, I haven't looked at the latest set, of all the different architectures you can support. You'd write one script and you could do ARM-based uh, Android. You can do BSD, BSD on ARM, right? You, all those embedded devices are out there. You can do Plan 9, right? All this stuff is out of the box supported. Linux on PPC. Who here has PPC64 systems that are part of their environment? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't it be great if you could use the exact same tool on it as you used on everything else and make it no longer that snowflake that you have to go and deal with, right? I mean, the, the, the key about scalable system administration, the key about DevOps is eliminating snowflakes. And Golang allows us to eliminate snowflakes left, right, and center, and that I think is a very, very good thing. Um, so yeah, so in conclusion, uh, you're now writing scripts, I'm sorry, you're writing services, not scripts, Services need the full software development life cycle, and Golang has really, really powerful features that make doing software engineering, good software engineering, easy deployment, easy uh, uh, management, right into the language, and there, it's all for free right out of the box. So I think Golang is the perfect language for DevOps development. That's it. Question over here. 
Anyone here have Windows 7 based systems that they're still having to deal with? Yeah, one, two, yeah, there's always some sad person where I feel really bad for you. We're hiring if you just want to run away from that. Hi. The uh, slash slash plus build kind of directive as a comment, it I, kind I of. Can't, I can't see where you are, I don't know where to look. Th that's all right. There we are, okay. Um, as a comment, feels kind of different to a, a modern language. Did that kind of come into the Golang a bit later than the, you know, the build underscore goos um, I can't. I'm not an expert in the history of the evolution of Golang, so I can't say what the motivation was. Um, having it at the beginning of the file, if, if you don't want to embed it in the file name because you often might have many, many different combinations that, you, that would have one single solution, a comment at the beginning, I mean, it's a very common developer-oriented thing to use comments to control compiler behavior. Um, you know, prag pragmas are another name for the same concept where here I have something in my code that's not part of the program, but it's really metadata for the compiler to understand how I intend this code to be used. And comments is traditionally a very standard way of, of achieving that end. Is there a bunch of other stuff in Go like that, other pragmas? Uh, there are some, but I, I do not encounter them in my day-to-day -day use of Go. So I'm, I'm sure there's more. I, I can't say with absolute certainty that the slash build one is, but they're needed very, very infrequently. Yeah. Hey, um, so one question. So in, in Python, one of the other things that make you scream in pain is C, -dips, C dependencies, basically. Yeah. Uh, That's that dependency hell where you've got a Python wrapper around a .so and you need the underlying package. Yeah. And you need to compile it, and you don't have the compiler, and then yep. on Windows, good luck. Yeah. Uh, do you have something like this in Go? Like can you can you certainly create that situation. There are Go wrappers around C libraries that, when made badly, require a .so. I mean, you, can all, you will encounter people who have done unconscionable things just because the language lets them do it. Um, hopefully, you you know, take them out back and hit them with a hammer until they stop doing it. But um, the, the, the flip side of that is, if there's a mission critical library that I've licensed from a vendor or that implements some key functionality, can I still reach it via Go? Yes, there are function there's functionality to call into C libraries, but one of the things that you will give up, obviously, is nothing will magically make a Solaris-only library that's wrappered by Go suddenly run on Windows 7. So yeah, um, the good news is, as a community and as a culture, that's seen as a bad solution to the problem, and so, um, I mean, in Python, it's, it's a perfectly culturally acceptable thing to wrap a C library and publish that out as, hey, I've got a wrapper around this. In Go, that's not seen as culturally and from a community perspective as a good solution to the problem. You might be told, I mean, it, that's more of a culture attitude toward it because you're giving up that cross-platform capability. All right, next one up here. Yep. Uh, how about database handling? How is da database handling? Yeah, database handling. Does it support database scripts and all? Uh, handle database scripts. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, uh, do you mean? We can write the scripts in Java and some other, like Python, we can handle the database. So can we write the script in Go as well? Um, what is it? There are libraries to connect to databases. I believe in the, in the example we just talked about, I believe people have wrapped JDBC drivers and so on with various in, unholy incantations. But there are, there are for MySQL and most of the major and Postgres and whatnot, there are third party libraries and community accepted standard libraries for connecting to databases, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got still Any another several minutes. Back while I'm here? Sure. Anyone? I heard it yet. Yeah, one right there. So your talk focused on the cross-platform, cross-compiling capability and the, the user experience of that, which is really nice. Um, in your intro, you mentioned that there were some other language features that you found useful in the general context of doing systems engineering, systems programming. So the, you, wait, you're systems talking engineering about. and systems programming yes. in general. Are there other language features in Go that you find attractive there that you found that you struggled with in, in other languages traditionally used for systems programming? Channels is the big thing. I mean, be, it took me a, a, probably a good well, from the first time I encountered Go, it was years before I finally wrote what I would consider my first real correctly implemented Go program. Once you begin to use channels as a way of flowing data from one stage of your program to the next, you get to the point where in 100, 
200 lines of code, you express something that in Python or in uh, uh, Java or in C++ would be thousands and thousands of lines of code. Now, because I worked at a company where Go was being pushed very heavily, I actually got to see this in action where someone would send out an email saying, oh, hey, I've taken this tool I've rewritten in Go, and they send out the commit message, and they're deleting 12,000 lines of code and committing a 150, 250 line program. And I, would, I saw that over the course of several years, and, I, and it blew me away because I would read these things, and I'm like, you know, if I only could get my head around how channels work, I would understand how they were able to eliminate so much code that simply moved data from this part of the program to that part of the program. And once I got my head around channels, that's when Go really opened up for me. When you look at how you can set up workflows that are chaining together, like the notion of reading from a file and processing it line by line. Uh, the naive solution is you slurp the whole file into an array of lines and then process the array. It, the, Go, the idiomatic Go version would be you set up a Go routine and give it a channel that receives lines, and it starts feeding one line at a time into that channel. You then make a separate Go routine who simply reads from that channel and does whatever you want to do per line, and that's it. But at that point, because you've abstracted away the reading from the file and the processing of it, you can then take that function that's, that reads that file and make it a streaming one that can read multi-terabyte files. Or instead, it does scattered reads from anyone who has to deal with HDFS uh, output where the file is split up among 100 or 1,000 different shard files. It makes it very easy to extend that reader. And instead, there's just this stream of, of data items coming in, and you have the exact same code. And none of it's cluttered with the, the weirdness of dealing with where that data is coming from. Instead, you have, I've got a, a processor that, for a line at a time, does some magic with data. And then I've got the weirdness that's per input mechanism. And that's where you end up eliminating massive chunks of code. Like, OK, if I'm doing file input, do this. If I'm doing uh, HDFS, if I'm reading from uh, Azure uh, um, Block Store, if I'm reading from, from uh, Amazon's uh, uh, S3 or something, you get all these special cases. But you can hide those in the special case handling code, and the actual logic ends up in one place. That also means when someone else comes along and says, hey, I want to extend this, they have one place where they do the extension, and the rest of the program just works. And this is good software engineering, because you get reusable components, reusable subsystems. So that's a really long answer to your question. All right. Are there any more? We probably have time for one Yeah, more. we still have a, a minute, and one minute. full minute. Anyone? He's got a quick one. No? It looks oh. like that might be it. Thank I'll you very much. Yay. All right. Thank you very much.